So, every year when I read the Bible, I try to read it cover to cover, try to. Um, and when I come to this particular section in the Bible, it intrigues me so much because it has stories of um, obedience, disobedience, love, hate, treachery, whatnot. It, it is so packed with drama inviting you into the story. And of course, if you haven't guessed, I'm talking about the books of First Samuel and Second Samuel. But the stories are, are so interesting and it kind of pulls you into the narrative. Now, for us, these are, these are uh, history books. But actually, the book of First Samuel and also Joshua and Kings and Samuel are actually part of the prophetic literature in the Hebrew Bible. So the, the Hebrew Bible, which is called the Tanakh, has the Torah, Nevim, and Ketavim, the law, the prophets, and the writings. So this, the book of Samuel is actually part of the prophets, not, not, not history literature. The reason is because this is not history for the sake of history, but this is a prophet writing the story of Israel from God's perspective. And that is why it is a history book. And for a lot of us, these are disconnected stories. We know the story of Moses here. We know the story of David here. And a little bit of stories here and there. But the Bible is one coherent story. So this morning, we're going to study the book of 1 Samuel. We're going to cover the whole book of 1 Samuel and condense the whole message of 1 Samuel and try to do that in this, in this one sermon. So... Just a bit of context as to um, what this book of 1 Samuel is about. I, I'm just going to paint a little bit of context before we dive uh, into the book. So God chooses Abraham and says that through you, I will bless the nations of the earth and from him come the nation of Israel. And this, the people of uh, Israel end up in captivity in uh, Egypt and God delivers them out of slavery and he leads them to the promised land. And... Uh, Moses um, um, uh, leads them and then after him Joshua and then there are many other judges who uh, rule the people of uh, or uh, guide the people of Israel and after that, only after that, we come to the monarchy where the kings start ruling. And the book of Judges was one of the darkest, darkest periods of Israel's history, right? So we, we read stories like a man cuts his wife into pieces and sends to every tribe of Israel. And another story where a woman uh, drives a tent peg through the temple of a man. I mean, it's, it's not a, it's, Judges is not a book you would read to your children at bedtime. And um, uh, it, it's like an R-rated novel. <laughs> and, um, but the last judge was one of the greatest prophets of Israel. Who was the last judge? Anybody remember? Who was the last judge of Israel? Samuel. Samuel was the last judge. And during the time of Samuel, the people ask for a king. And that's where we're going to start. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 4 to 7. Let's read together. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us such as all the other nations have. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. So people said, we want a king like all the other nations. So God treats that as them rejecting him. So we need to understand asking for the king in itself was not the issue there. But the heart, their heart's condition underlying that request was the real problem. You see, the God appointed judge, what, the, when the judges ruled over, like say uh, Moses or Joshua, when a judge ruled over the people of Israel, it is not them ruling. It was God's instruction these judges take and they pass it on to the people of Israel. So, um, so to, be, to be led by a God-appointed judge meant to get their act right and to obey God and follow His ways. And they said, we, we don't want all that business. Because if you look at the book of, book of Judges, the people, they sin against God and they end up in 
uh, servitude to other nations because of their sin. And when they're in captivity, they cry out to God for mercy. God raises a judge. This judge saves them. And once life is comfortable, they go back in the same cycle. And this cycle repeats for almost 14 times in the book of Judges. And it's like, we don't want all of this. Forget, you know, a God leading us through a judge and telling us what to do when we don't obey, and when we don't obey, having these consequences, all that. Let's forget all of that. Let's have a king like every other nation around us. You now, we will have a big, strong king. He will fight the battles. He will make sure our, our nation is right. So we, so give us a king like that. So underlying that request was the thing that they do not want to, God to tell them what to do. Because a human king, they can twist. A king is malleable, but they cannot twist God. God, is, God doesn't work like that. So asking king in itself was not the problem, but the underlying heart condition of the people that want to do away with God telling them what to do. Because way back in Deuteronomy, Moses already gives them instructions on what kind of king to appoint over the people of Israel. So these are the instructions for appointing a king. Moses gives them in Deuteronomy. The king should not consider himself better than the other Israelites. He should not run after wealth and money and horses and getting more wives. He should have a copy of the law always with him, read and meditate on it all his life, and follow the decrees of God. These are the instructions God already gave the people of Israel on how to appoint a king. So the problem was not asking for a king, but the underlying heart condition. So God grants their request and Samuel appoints Saul as the king. And Saul was head and shoulders above everybody else. You know, he was this tall, handsome figure and all of that. And Saul actually started really well. He started really well. And in fact, in the beginning, he felt he was too small and insignificant to be a king. When, when Samuel looked for Saul, Saul was hiding among the supplies. So he, was, he, was, he felt he was too small. He was humble and all of that. He, he had a right attitude when he became king. And it says that when Saul became king, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon Saul and he even prophesied when he became king. And he received a new heart from God, it says in scripture. And um, not everybody liked Saul becoming king. Because he was a Benjamite. Benjamin is a 12th tribe. And they're like, hey, why? how come a Benjamite can rule over us? Some people thought. And some of them didn't like um, um, a Benjamite becoming their king. The first king, uh, for that matter. And... Um, um, and after, uh, a little bit after that, the people of Jabesh Gilead. So Jabesh Gilead is the, the nation of Israel. If you see the map of the nation of Israel, you know, you have the Jordan River and the left of the Jordan River is the majority of the land. You have nine and a half tribes and two and a half tribes to the right of the Jordan. So this, the right of the Jordan, the, the tribes this side, there was a prominent city called Jabesh Gilead and they were attacked by the Ammonites and and uh, Saul fights valiantly and rescues the people of Jabesh Gilead. And people are so glad that we have a king who fights our battles uh, with God's help and all of that. And that is when people say, bring to us the people who said Saul should not become king. We'll put them to death. But you know what Saul said? No, we are not going to put anybody to death. This is a new beginning. That was Saul when he started off. He had his heart in the right place. But then things went downhill and his heart became corrupted. And in fact, the downfall of Saul is revealed to us in three major incidents. And all these three major incidents come in three battle contexts where we see the heart of Saul slowly going downhill. And the first incident is at Gilgal. 1 Samuel chapter 13. Saul remains, shall we read it together? Saul remained at Gilgal and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal and Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived and Saul went out to greet him. 
What have you done? asked Samuel. Saul replied, When I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I have not sought the Lord's favor, so I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. And, Sa and Samuel replies, You have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. What an amazing promise to solve. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. See, Sam, Saul was given a very clear instruction that, that Samuel would come. He said seven days time and that Samuel would come and make the offering. And God made it very clear the duties of different roles. Um, the, the, the three prominent roles were of the prophet, the priest and the king. And, and, the kings, and the king was not supposed to do the priestly duties because a priest was, uh, the priestly family was set apart by God as holy to do the priestly duties. And, um, and Samuel was supposed to um, offer, make the offerings because, you know, whenever the king went out to battle, they went to their God, be it any nation, they went to their God, made the offerings before they went to battle. And so Saul, Samuel said that he will come and do the offerings. So, and, and Samuel was one of the rarest people in the Bible who played all three roles of a prophet, a priest, and a king because he was also a judge. So, so Samuel, so people wait, the, uh, the king and his army wait for, as it, was, as it was coming close to the seven days, people became restless and the army began to scatter and people began to go away. And, and Saul felt insecure. Hey, I am the king, I am the boss, People cannot just leave like that. The, I, I can't let people scatter, you know, from my army and all of that. So I will offer the offerings. I will offer the burnt offering. And Saul goes ahead and offers the burnt offering, implying his pride. He was insecure. And then uh, we see pride taking over and him offering the offerings, which only a priest would do. And then to top, to top all of that, when Samuel came and confronted him, saying, hey, you did a foolish thing, instead of repenting and coming back to God, he started defending himself. You know, the enemy was coming, you did not come, the people were scattering. Now, when God confronts you, you just say, sorry, you don't defend yourself. And Saul here was trying to defend himself. He was twisting his word instead of coming back to God with all his heart. So in summary, he was insecure. He was more concerned about his image before men than before God. He took the priesthood into his own hands, implying his pride. He defended himself and twisted his words instead of coming back to God with all his heart. You know, throughout this, throughout this sermon, you know, when I'm, whenever I'm listing these things, I might not directly sometimes ask you to think and reflect, but whatever the points that I put here for Saul or for David or whatever is put here, I want you to apply to yourself and also reflect on those things yourself as well. So now, let's go to the second incident. The first incident was at Gilgal, and the second incident is at Michmash, 1 Samuel chapter 14. Now, just a bit of a context before we read this. You see, um, the people of the, the Philistines were bitter enemies with, with the nation of Israel for a very, very, very long time. In fact, um, if you look at history, um, about in the first century AD, um, and even in the second century AD, AD as well, when the Jews revolted against uh, um, the Romans, and the Romans crushed the, the Jews, and they renamed the nation of Israel as Palestine to, as an insult by, by renaming it uh, after their arch enemy, which is uh, the people of the Philistines, which is the same as Palestine. So th they were bitter enemies. And so in this particular incident, in 1 Samuel chapter uh, 14, Saul was going against uh, a battle against Philistines. And he was like, 
at any cost we got to win this battle and until we win this battle i'm not going to eat anything and he says that none of you the army also are supposed to eat anything and he puts an oath on them he make he, he makes them take an oath that they would not eat anything as well i mean can you imagine going to battle without eating and i just for um uh sharing the word in three services itself i, f- I felt so tired at 11 o'clock i called my life group person to bring meal for me i imagine going to a battle without food it, it is it is difficult right so and that is what um saul places an oath on his army so and that is the context with which we'll we'll read this particular passage the entire army entered the woods and there was honey on the ground when they went into the woods they saw the honey oozing out yet no one put his hand to his mouth because they feared the oath but jonathan had not heard that his father had bound the people with the oath so he reached out the end of the staff that was in his hand and dipped it into the honeycomb and there are many verses after that we will not read all of that so jonathan was not aware of the oath he goes and takes the honeycomb and he eats and his eyes were brightened it says if you read meaning that his strength was recovered and um, and after that he infiltrates into the philistine camp and he um, defeats them and the entire israelite army joins with him and they pursue the people of the philistines and defeat them uh, and then after the after that they take the cattle and the sheep that they that they uh, um, uh, from the plunder and they butcher them on the ground and start eating because they were so absolutely famished and hungry after the battle imagine and they started eating and they threw out their kosher law diet uh, kosher dietary laws and they were not keeping the law and so people went and complained to Saul and Saul said hey do not sin against the lord so he prepares a rock where they could offer these animals and then um the, and then they uh, went and uh, removed the blood from the animal and and ate so like think about this this incident right saul was a driven man who put others at risk for his own ambitions shall we bring up this like saul was a driven man who put others at risk for his own ambitions and to top that when saul came to know that jonathan has eaten the honey and all that he said jonathan broke the oath he must die imagine because of him they won the battle that day and he's saying Jonathan must die his mad drivenness clouded his reason many times and some of us can get into this driven attitude for our own ambitions whatever that is we can get into this uh, we, we, this whole world we are living in today is a very rat race the culture and and sometimes this mad drivenness can cloud our reason and we might even put our family at risk so and we are not called to be driven people we are called people amen we are not driven people in a mad driven race in the world but we are called people so now let's go to the third incident in the life of um Saul this is about destroying the amalekites in first samuel chapter 15 let's read it together samuel said to Saul I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel so listen now to the message from the Lord this is what the Lord almighty says i will punish the amalekites for what they did to israel when they waylaid them as they came up from egypt now go attack the amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them do not spare them put to death men and women children and infants cattle and sheep camels and donkeys you see the people of amalekites were very wicked people we will god tells that in the next passage we will see when the people of israel came out from egypt and they were going to the promised land at one point they did not have water and they were extremely tired and this is this is not just an army right you have women children cattle livestock and in in such a vulnerable condition of the whole people of israel the amalekites unprovoked come and attack those vulnerable israelites from behind and that is the kind of people they were 
And God, Moses, right there itself in Exodus, he says, God is going to blot out the name of Amalek from under the earth. And now, when Saul becomes king, God is fulfilling that word and is saying, go attack the Amalekites and destroy them. And, go, and so, Saul goes and he uh, wins the battle and all of that. But he spares all the good sheep and the good cattle because he says the, the, his army didn't want to, you know, let go of this good sheep and cattle, all that. Let's read that. The next uh, from verses 17 to 21. Samuel said, Although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and he sent you on a mission saying, Go and completely destroy these wicked people, the Amalekites. Wage war against them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder? and do evil in the eyes of the Lord. And Saul replied, But I did obey the Lord. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag their king. The soldiers took the sheep and cattle from the plunder. The best of what was devoted to God in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. The soldiers took it. And what do we want to do? We want to give it as offering to God. And this is what Samuel replies, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams, for rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. You see, Saul considered the opinions of others more important than that of God. Because the people felt that, you know, we should not destroy the good, nice-looking sheep and all that. And he said, okay, let's not, let's not destroy them. Sometimes we are like that. When God tells us, us to do them, we obey a lot of things. But when something is appealing to us, nice, look, looking good to us, we are like, okay, maybe this I will not. You know, we know that sometimes, you know, we, we are not supposed to be unequally yoked to an unbeliever. And so you're attracted to this person who is not a believer. And you're like, but Lord, isn't, isn't she a little cute? Just like what Saul said, they're good-looking, healthy-looking animal cattle. How can I offer them? And he said, I, the reason I spared them is to offer to the Lord. He placed more value on religious ritual over a personal relationship with God. He was too preoccupied with his image before people than before a holy God, trying to please them, what they want. And again, the same thing. Instead of repenting, he again defended himself. So what happens is after this whole incident, Samuel was very upset with Saul and he, he walks off. And saw, you know what Saul says? He says, hey, I'm sorry, I've done wrong. Please come and honor me before the people. His whole worry was that Samuel would come and offer the offerings so that people would think that he is still king and everything is good with him. He was more concerned about Samuel coming back and honoring him before people than truly repenting. You see, repentance is not just about saying sorry. Saul said, hey, yeah, after all his defense, he said, yeah, I'm sorry, I did wrong. But repentance is not just about saying sorry but it is coming back to God with all your heart and building that relationship again. I mean, imagine if you caused a deep hurt to your spouse, right? It is not just about, hey, I'm sorry, and just getting along. It is to look into your heart and say, hey, where have I gone wrong? Why did I behave this way? I'm going to put new boundaries that this won't happen again. And then you, you build the trust and the relationship once again. That is what true repentance looks like. But what Saul is doing here is that, hey, I'm sorry, can we get along? So repentance is not about just saying sorry, but it is coming back to God. Shall we put that on the slide? Repentance is not about just saying sorry, but coming back to God with all your heart and building the relationship. So in summary, Saul was a driven man who put others at risk for his own ambitions. His mad drivenness clouded his reason many times. He was more concerned about his image before men than before God. 
He took the priesthood into his own hands, implying his pride. He defended himself and twisted his words instead of coming with all his heart before God. He considered the opinions of others and what they thought more than that of God. He placed value on religious ritual over a personal relationship with God. And sometimes we could be like that. You know, coming to church or a life group or attending this and this are more important than a relationship with God. We want a good image before a good church-going guy than a personal relationship with God. And he was too preoccupied with his image before people than before a holy God. Power corrupted a man who was once small in his own eyes to the point that Samuel was sure that he would even kill him. You see, when, when uh, God told Samuel, go to Bethlehem and anoint David, you know what Samuel said? If Saul comes to know of this, he's going to kill me. That is the extent to which Saul was corrupted. And God rejected Saul and gave the kingdom over to one of his neighbors, which is David. You see, when, when um, Samuel went to anoint David, God did not tell the name. God did not tell, go anoint David. He said, go to Bethlehem, go to the family of Jesse, and I will tell you who to anoint as king. So, you know, Saul had the ex Samuel, Samuel already had the experience because Saul was head and shoulders tall above everybody. So he thought God will again choose somebody who is very tall and handsome and good looking and all of that. So when the, when the sons of Jesse came, he thought, okay, this guy is like very tall and, you know, head and shoulders above everyone. Probably this is the guy. And God said, no, do not look at, look, look at the appearance because God does not look at the heart look at the outward appearance, but he looks at the heart. And this is the key thing here. If David was a man after God's own heart, Saul was a man after man's own heart. Because that is what they wanted, a big, tall, strong guy who will lead, in, 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 who will lead us in our battles and keep our nation safe. He was a man after man's own heart. And, and when, you, when, you, when you seek a man after man's own heart, that man also is going to be a man after man's own heart to please people, to save his image and all of that. And that was the man that, Samuel, that, that Saul was. If David was a man after God's own heart, Saul was a man after man's own heart. Saul stood for what people wanted. David represented what God desired. Saul was corrupt to the point of opening, e opening door for evil spirits. He, his, he kept hardening his heart till the point that he opened door for evil spirits. And even after that, he sought human remedies. Then coming back to God with all his heart, he said, bring me a harpist so that when he plays music, I can feel better. Instead of repenting and coming back to God, he sought human remedies. And he became very insecure and jealous about David. Insecurity and jealousy rots the human heart. And right from the beginning, when, when they said Saul killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands, right from then, insecurity and jealousy has corrupted this man's heart. And this in many ways is to be expected, given what we see of him in the previous passages. Now, sometimes we think, you know, God was more partial to David than to Saul. David did worse things too. But let me change your mind. Saul was relentless in his pursuit to kill David. Let me read out a few things here. He wanted to kill the best man in his army, the one who risked his own life to save Israel against the Philistines, David. He hurled a spear at David, right, when he was playing the harp. He sent David on dangerous missions, thinking that some other army will kill David. He sent men to David's home itself to kill him. He hunted him down throughout Israel incessantly. He had informants everywhere to inform about David. He killed an entire priestly family, not for helping David, but for a suspicion of helping David. An entire priestly family at a place called Nob. He was relentless even after David spared Saul's life twice. That's the amount to which his heart was corrupt. And on the contrary, on the contrary, next slide, David knew the God he served, that he was the living God. And when he went in, his, in this battle against Goliath, 
he said that you know you come to me with your spear and javelin but i come to you in the name of the living god who is this uncircumcised philistine that he should defile the armies of god i mean he's like we serve the living god david knew the god he served and his life won the respect of his brothers who once despised him you know his brothers when 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 david goes to give lunch box to his brothers they say hey where did you leave those few sheep of yours what are you you came to say the drama of the battle here you know that's how his brothers treated but we see in the later passages his brothers when when david was on the run from saul that's where our title comes from david was on the run from saul he was in hiding when when david was on the run and he was in hiding his brothers come and join along with david's group so he won the respect of his brothers and david cared for his own people while saul tried to kill his own son for his ambitions because david he seeks asylum for his parents you know he since he was on the run he couldn't take care of his parents um you know what if somebody harms him what if saul harms his parents so what he does is he takes his parents and seeks asylum in moab why moab probably because his great grandmother ruth is from moab we don't know why he went to moab but probably that's one reason and so david cared for his own while saul tried to kill his own son and david always committed himself to the lord he said the lord will protect he has promised me he has led me he is going to protect me and god did not and it many times repeatedly you will see this verse but the lord did not give him into the hands of saul and i want to tell you when god has purposes for your life no man can stop that when jesus was in his earthly ministry many times people tried to kill him what did he say my time has not yet come when god has purposes for your life even if the greatest person i mean who is greater than the king of israel in israel right even when the the king of israel when he relentlessly pursues to kill david still he couldn't do anything because the lord did not give him into the hands of saul when you commit yourself into the hands of god and not worry about people's opinions whatever god is your protector god fights your battles and god is behind you and abigail makes this beautiful beautiful statement to david she says even though a man is trying to kill you relentlessly the lord has bound your life securely in the bundle of the living what a beautiful statement she makes to david the lord has bound your life securely in the bundle of the living that's what god did to david because he trusted god and let's move on david did not worry about people's opinions his first allegiance was always to god now at one point when he was on the run he he wanted to rescue this people of keila against the philistines they were in trouble and his men were like hey you yourself are in trouble running away why do you want to go and rescue these people but he was like no and he he consults god and god tells him go and rescue these people so david did not was not coerced by the people's opinions and when he had a chance to kill Saul in a cave and he says i will not lay my hand on the lord's anointed he 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 just cuts the robe of Saul and even for that he was conscious conscience stricken that he cut the robe of Saul and in another instance in the desert of zif david and abishai go to Saul when he was not under his guard on his guard Saul was sleeping and all the and all his army was sleeping around him David and Abishai were there i mean imagine your enemy is there all asleep he's in your hands one thrust into his body david's problems are over i mean if if somebody tells you all your problems are done overnight do this one thing wouldn't you do that he was running away all his life he had one chance to end all his troubles he tells abishai i'm not going to do that abishai tells him kill him i mean he 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 can reason it through saying that lord he is trying to kill me uh, unnecessarily i mean i have done no wrong i have every right to kill him he doesn't do that he commits himself to the lord and another incident when you know when 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 saul was seeking asylum with the king of the philistines he was he was staying in the border of judah and uh, philistia which is ziklag and you know he and his people 
when they go out for some other battle, some raiders come and take all of David and his men's um, livestock and uh, their property and their wives and children, everything, these raiders come and take away. And all the people who were with David, they want to kill David now and stone him to death. Why? We followed you and all this came upon us. We trusted you and followed you and now we lost our wives, our children, our property, our livestock, everything is gone. But you know what? David, instead of feeling crushed and insecure and whatever, it says he encouraged himself in the Lord. He went to the Lord. He encouraged himself in the Lord. He pursues those people. He brings back all that was lost. And the people said, you know, some people go with him into the battle and the others who complained stayed with the supplies. And the people who went to the battle said, don't give them the plunder. And David rebukes them and said, no. He, he made this rule that the people who went with to the battle and people who kept watch over the supplies get the same portion of the plunder. That was David. He didn't care about people's opinions. He knew, for him, his first allegiance was to God and that he has to honor God and his, what God wants him to. And you know what? Saul pursued David in spite of knowing fully well that David will become king. At one, at one point when David spares Saul's life, Saul calls out to David, David and says, Hey, my son David, I know that you will become the king of Israel one day. And when you become king, show mercy to my family. He knows fully well that David was certainly going to become king. And yet he hardens his heart and tries to kill David. And that is the biggest difference between Saul and John the Baptist. John the Baptist, when Jesus came on the scene, what did he say? He must increase and I must decrease. You know, Saul could have taken that route and say, Hey, David, you are my son-in-law. You know, David was his son-in-law. He could have said, you know, I want to help you how to become a good king. I made some mistakes. Make sure you don't do the same mistakes. And he could have guided David and helped him, you know, and let him increase and he decrease. But he did not do that. And the height of David's pain is revealed in this particular passage. I'm going to read that. This is one of the saddest passages or one of the saddest verses in, in the book of 1 Samuel. And this is what it says. 1 Samuel chapter 26, 19 to 20. David is saying to Saul, shall we read that? We bring that up on the screen. Yeah, this is what David tells to Saul. Now, let my Lord the king listen to his servant's words. If the Lord has incited you against me, then may he accept an offering. I mean, if, if it is God who is sending you against me, then let us go, let us settle the matter and we will we'll give an offering to the Lord. But if people have incited you against me for whatever reason, because there is no reason for you to come against me, then may they be cursed. They have driven me today from my share in the Lord's inheritance and have said, go serve other gods. Now do not let my blood fall to the ground far from the presence of the Lord. The king of Israel has come out to look for a flea as one hunts a patridge in the mountains. That's very sad. Like, you see, for a Jew, for an Israelite, you know, his, his belongingness as, the, uh, as part of the people of Israel and, and the land of Israel is, it gives him a sense of identity. Because, you know, God promised this land to them and they, and they inherited this land, the nation of Israel, and, and, the, and the land was divided. This was the portion for Judah and this was for the people of Bethlehem and this is for the, for the people of Jesse. And they, and they, and they took pride in the, in the fact that God gave them this promised land and they worshipped the Lord together and all of that. And now he's driven away from his inheritance and said, go serve other gods. Imagine how David would feel. I don't know if you're capturing this, but let me give you an example to understand what it means. You know, my grandfather, he has lived all his life in my village, right? He's, he's a very inspirational guy. I mean, I look up to him so much. He passed, passed away a few years back when he was close to 90. Now, he, he worked really hard all his life. He saved so much. I mean, he... Uh, worked really, really hard all his life and made savings and bought some land and all of that and gave a good living for my dad and my uncles and aunt and all of that. So, and imagine the government comes to my grandpa and says, Hey you, 
we are going to seize all your land, your property, your house, everything, and you're out. Imagine how he would feel. That is all he knew all his life. The people, the land, everything. And imagine he's on the road. That is what David felt. I'm, I'm being driven away today from my Lord's inheritance. Do not let my blood fall to the ground far from the presence of the Lord. That's a heartbreaking statement. And that's what happened to David. And Saul continued his resistance. And he became so stony hearted that at the end of it, he, he even lost his relationship with the Lord. And in this final battle, he goes and seeks a sorcerer, a medium, a spiritist, in order to understand the course of action for the, for the battle that he is going to fight against the Philistines. And in that battle, Saul loses his life in the battle. He was very badly wounded and almost in the pangs of death. And uh, he falls, he knows that the Philistines, if they catch him, they're going to torture him. So he falls on his, sword, his own sword and dies. What a tragic ending. Now, lest you think David was perfect, he was not. He went after his desires many times. You know, the man who wouldn't lay a hand on the Lord's anointed killed an innocent man, Uriah the Hittite. Right? And the sin with Bathsheba weakened his moral position in his family. You know, when his sons messed up and did all kinds of nonsense, he could not correct his sons and set things right in his family. Probably be because he lost his moral position in the family. They would have said, hey, David, look what you have done. You know, when uh, the follow-up sermon to this on 2 Samuel, this whole thing is from 1 Samuel. In 2 Samuel, we will look at all these things. But, you know, but I just wanted to mention briefly that Samuel, uh, uh, David wasn't perfect. He had all of this. He did not sternly settle the issues with his family. But David repented like his life depended on God. That is what David did. He threw his heart completely after God and gave himself fully after God. Even in his darkest moments, he sought the Lord. He could not even bear the fact that he could be away from God even for a moment. I mean, look at the Psalms. In everything he saw God. Probably when he was a shepherd boy, he wrote, the Lord is my shepherd. Just like I watch over the shepherd, the Lord watches over me. When he goes to the army, with his army and all of that, he's like, the Lord is my shield. The Lord is my rock and my fortress. Just like a rock gives refuge to the army, in the same way, the Lord is my refuge and my fortress. With him, I can even scale a wall. Now, that was David in everything. He sought God and he couldn't even bear the fact that for a moment he would be away from God. When Nathan rebukes David for that whole incident of Bathsheba, he repents. And, and out of that penitential psalm, we read the Psalm 51, which is such a beautiful psalm of what repentance ought to be like. And that was David. And most of the psalms that David has written were written when he was on the run from Saul, during some of the darkest moments of his life. And I want to end with this last slide. You see, David was on the run from Saul. David was on the run for many years before he became king. But the important thing was that he was on the run after God's own heart. Amen? Let me read that again. David was on the run for many years before he became king. But the important thing was that he was on the run after God's own heart. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Father, we want to be people who run after your heart, Lord. We want to be people who run after your heart. We don't want to be people who are jealous, insecure. We don't want to think about people's opinions or value people's opinions above you, O oh Father. We don't want to put value in a, in a ritual religious ritual over a personal relationship with you, O oh Father. We want to run after you, Jesus. We want to put our trust squarely in you that when you have promised us, no man can hinder us. 
when you have led us when you have called us nothing is going to stop us from walking in your purposes because you are our protector you are our provision you are our provider and nothing is going to harm us father so lord we don't want to be a man after man's own heart the opinions of man the thoughts of man but lord we want to run after your heart made be said of us this is a man after god's own heart